evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to this evening's uh, seminar, which is on reckonings and forced confrontations after the Holocaust. Uh, my name is Dan Stone. I'm Professor of Modern History at Royal Holloway, University of London. Uh, and I'm also a co-curator, along with Christine Schmidt from the Wiener Holocaust Library, of the exhibition Death Marches, Evidence and Memory. Uh, and this uh, seminar tonight is part of a series of events associated uh, with that exhibition. The exhibition is uh, an initiative of the Holocaust and Genocide Research Partnership and uh, is being shown both at the Wiener Holocaust Library in London and at the Holocaust Education uh, Learning Centre uh, on the campus of the University of Huddersfield. And tickets uh, to both of those uh, places can be booked uh, via their websites. Uh, just a couple of words of housekeeping and then I will hand over to tonight's chair. Firstly, to say uh, everybody will be kept on mute throughout the programme, uh, but please feel free to post any comments or questions in the chat. Uh, after the panellists have finished their discussion, uh, we'll try and get to as many of the questions as possible uh, and we can stay on a little bit longer uh, if that's okay with uh, with the panelists because uh, there are four speakers uh, tonight so uh, one more than usual so uh, we could go a little longer we've uh, we've turned on auto captioning for accessibility uh, please note uh, that it's automated so it doesn't quite always capture uh, what's uh, what the speaker is saying uh, particularly on this subject um, and if it annoys you and you don't need it you can also turn it off uh, by clicking on uh, the relevant button at the bottom of the screen. Uh, Imogen um, will be uh, posting helpful terms and links in the chat uh, throughout uh, tonight's event. So if you have any uh, technical difficulties, uh, you can send her a direct message and she'll try to help out. Finally, the uh, event is being recorded and will be on uh, the Vena Holocaust Library's YouTube channel tomorrow, uh, but your camera will not appear on screen. Uh, so with that, uh, I will hand over to our chair uh, tonight is uh, Dr. Alex Kay, who is Senior Lecturer in History at the University of Potsdam uh, and a lifetime fellow of the Royal Historical Society. He specializes in the history of Germany from 1914 to 45, national socialist policies of extermination and comparative research on genocide and mass violence. He has published five acclaimed books on Nazi Germany, including The Making of an SS Killer, which appeared in 2016 with Cambridge University Press, and Empire of Destruction, a history of Nazi mass killing, which is due out later this year with Yale University Press. And with that, I will hand over to Alex. Thank you very much, Dan, for that uh, kind introduction, and to you and Christine for the invitation, and also to Imogen for uh, organizing things. Um, I'm honoured and excited to be chairing this panel this evening on reckonings and forced confrontations after the Holocaust. I'd like to start by introducing my four co-panellists uh, in alphabetical order. We have uh, Professor Margaret Myers-Feinstein. She's a clinical assistant professor in Jewish studies at Loyola Marymount Mount University. She received a PhD in modern European history from the University of California, Davis and was also assistant professor of history at Indiana University South Bend and a research scholar at the UCLA Center for the Study of Women and the UCLA Center for Jewish Studies. Interested in the legacies of Nazism, she's published on post-war German national identity and on Jewish Holocaust survivors, including the books State Symbols, 1949 to 1959, and Holocaust Survivors in Post-War Germany, 1945 to 1957 as well as numerous book chapters and articles. Most recently, she published Reconsidering Jewish Rage After the Holocaust in the Palgrave Handbook of Holocaust Literature and Culture. And her current project on retribution after the Holocaust has received support from the Hadassah Brandeis Institute and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Welcome, Margaret. Our second panelist is Dr. Stefan Hördler. He is lecturer at the Institute for Economic and Social History, University of Göttingen in Germany. Specializes in 20th century German and transnational history, Holocaust and genocide studies, social and economic history. Is the author and co-editor of several books, including Die Fotografische Inszenierung des Verbrechens, an album aus Auschwitz, which roughly translates as The Photographic Staging of the Crime, an album from Auschwitz and Ordnung und Inferno, das KZ-System im letzten Kriegsjahr, Order and Inferno, the concentration camp system in the final year of the war. 
He's a member of several academic advisory boards in Europe, and for the past decade, he's served as an expert consultant in a number of international investigations against former Nazi camp personnel. Welcome, Stefan. Our third panelist is Professor Christopher Moriello, who is Professor of History and Director of the Centre for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Salem State University. He teaches and researches in the fields of modern European intellectual and cultural history, World War II, the Holocaust and comparative genocide studies. He's author, among other things, of the book Forced Confrontation, The Politics of Dead Bodies in Germany at the End of World War II, and co-author of From Boston to Berlin, A Journey Through World War II in Images and Words. His current research focuses on the end of World War II and the complex political, social, and cultural meanings imposed on dead bodies and human remains in the wake of war and mass violence. Welcome, Chris. And last but not least, uh, Dr. Martin Clements Winter, who studied history, sociology, and communication and media science in Leipzig. His PhD thesis, Gewalt und Erinnerung im ländlichen Raum, die deutsche Bevölkerung und die Todesmärsche, Violence and Remembrance in Rural Areas, the German Population and the Death Marches, was awarded the Stanislav Samechnik Research Award of the Comité International de Dachau in 2018. And he has worked in memorial sites, in historical political education and exhibition projects. From 2017 to 2020, he worked for the Lord Mayor of the city of Leipzig with a focus on memorial events and the culture of remembrance. Last year, he held a postdoctoral research grant from the Fritz Bauer Institute in Frankfurt am Main. And since this year, he is Alfred Landecker Lecturer at the Leipzig University, working on the project Corporate Culture, Forced Labour, and mass murder at the Hazak Armaments Company in Leipzig, funded by the Alfred Landecker Foundation. Welcome, Martin. So there are panelists, all experts in their own right. And I'd like to get the discussion going this evening by uh, posing a handful of questions to our panelists. Uh, first of all, and I'd like to start with uh, Martin with this question. As far as we know, no explicit uh, comprehensive order was, was issued for the murder of concentration camp prisoners before their liberation by the Allies. So if not the murder of the prisoners, what then was the main purpose of the camp evacuations that we'll be talking about this evening, the so-called death marches? An attempt to preserve the labour force of the camp inmates as long as possible, or the exploitation of the prisoners as pawns in Heinrich Himmler's pursuit of a separate peace with the Western Allies. What would be your take on that, Martin? Um, I think, um, first of all, uh, good evening. Thanks, uh, thanks for having, having me here. Um, I think uh, we have to consider a, a wide uh, range of, uh, of factors uh, when we uh, talk about this. And I think you mentioned uh, some of them already in, in your question and uh, the other uh, panelists will also have their own uh, focus. Um, I think uh, from my uh, perspective, uh, dealing especially with uh, the, the civil population uh, during the death marches, um, I would like to highlight uh, that um, the, there is um, a gender discourse uh, behind uh, the, the last um, orders to evacuate the camps, because um, those final orders, they were uh, actually based on a patriarchal uh, concept of an urgent threat for the female part of the so-called Volksgemeinschaft. Um, as you might know, uh, Himmler's final order said, no prisoner shall fall into the hands of the enemy alive. This is uh, the most uh, cited uh, order in, in literature, um, and which I, I think is the core uh, that no prisoner uh, should be liberated alive. But uh, the sentence goes on and it says, uh, the prisoners in Buchenwald um, misbehaved against the uh, civilian population. Um, this was obviously a lie. Uh, and uh, the rape of German women is um, not explicitly expressed in this uh, phrase. But uh, we know from other sources that the idea of concentration camp prisoners mass raping German women was actually in Himmler's mind when he issued that order. Uh, and behind this uh, is the idea that uh, the rape of women represents the symbolic violation of the collective body of the Volksgemeinschaft. Um, of course, this German horror vision was a false uh, rumor 
but um, it has to be seen in the context of the advancing Red Army in the East, um, going along with actual mass rape by Soviet soldiers. And it has to be seen against the background of a specific demographic situation in small German communities, where the neighborhood consisted largely of strangers, foreign forced laborers, German refugees, German military units going through the uh, villages and so on. And lots of native men were in the Wehrmacht and the leftovers, younger, older or disabled men, they were the ones who felt they had to defend their property and their women. Um, and it's quite interesting to see that this uh, gender discourse had an impact both uh, on the orders on the top, uh, as well as on concrete action uh, on the ground when uh, those uh, men were the ones uh, who took action against uh, concentration camp prisoners in their communities. And I think it's quite paradox because um, the goal was to keep the prisoners away from German population if you believe in what Himmler says in his order, but actually the death marches spread them all over Germany into the smallest communities. Thank you, Martin. That's a really interesting and insightful perspective, this idea, this fear of mass rape if thousands, hundreds of thousands indeed of concentration camp prisoners are left unguarded and free to roam in rural areas. Uh, Chris, would you have anything to, to add to that perspective or, on what we've already discussed? A lot of my comments, I got it. Uh, a lot of my comments tonight will go back to this idea of um, a kind of a heterogeneous uh, situation that changed over time. Um, I've, I've focused mostly on the death marches um, that occurred in April and May of 1945 within Germany as the war is just about to end. So there's, there's always two features that I emphasize is that, you know, change over time, things changed between January of 45 and, and May of 45. And the situation became increasingly deteriorated in terms of chaos, in terms of orders of possibilities. And so when you say what was the, the, the reason for the death marches, I think that Martin covered that. And I think that's it's quite a great perspective to look at it from a gendered perspective and, and Himmler's order. But I, I think by April and May, particularly from Buchenwald camp to, to Weimar, the one of the death marches that I've studied, there's a real breakdown in command and control in the German army and um, possibilities, for example, starting by train and then ending up on foot or trains being bombed or strafed. I think, I think the idea behind the death march has changed and evolved in a very situational way. So to have a general conclusion of this is the reason why the death march happened, I would have to know what death march you're talking about because death marches, some of them lasted for multiple weeks, some of them lasted a very short time, some of them covered thousands of miles, some of them covered 10 miles. So it depends on what death march it is. And I know that's an insufficient answer, but uh, historians are great for partial answers. Um, so I, I really would look forward to the other um, broader perspectives on, uh, on, on why these death marches uh, were ordered and then how the orders were carried out. Thank you, Chris. I think that's an excellent answer. I, I completely agree with you that uh, the death marches were not a, a monolithic event. This is a, a series of very disparate, varied uh, events over a, an extended period of time. And you, and you mentioned the difference between January 1945 and May 1945. And you could even extend that and say the difference between the evacuations of summer 1944 and the evacuations of spring 1945 are even more different in their nature. Uh, Margaret, uh, what would your, be your take on this? Well, I think about the, the motives of the individual soldiers, right? So they've already been given the order, they've already evacuated uh, the prisoners, um, but so often they end up taking a very circuitous route or, um, and then also the, the decision to murder or not to murder the prisoners. And uh, Gerhard Weinberg and Doris Bergen have suggested that the soldiers, the guards, um, had some self-interest in their motives. That is long, which ends up being somewhat contradictory. On the one hand, they wanna keep the prisoners alive because as long as they keep them alive, they have someone to guard and that prevents them from being transferred to a battlefront unit. And so they get to stay away from the front, right? Also, they're evacuating them into Germany, which means they're able to flee from the advancing allied forces. So a lot of self-interest there. At the same time, 
you know, the, the murders, particularly of the stragglers, I think can also be seen as part of that self-interest. They don't want to be slowed down because they're trying to get away from the front. And so all of that sort of combines uh, in uh, the way in which these death marches take place. Um, you know, we have some where the guards take very seriously this idea that uh, no prisoner should be allowed to fall into allied hands. And so they end up, you know, putting them in a barn and burning them to death or, or mass shooting them. Um, and yet others suddenly decide that their self-interest is primary and they just disappear as the uh, allied troops advance so that they can you know, change into civilian clothes and melt into the local population. So um, that's another factor I just wanna add on to these other great uh, answers. Thank you, Margaret. Yeah, the, the self-interest and the motivations of the individual guards, I think, are a crucial um, in, 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 a, in a very, very uh, tangible way, maybe even more so than some of the other mass crimes of the Nazis. Here, it's very much a question of how does the individual guard react in a given situation? And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on um, with my next question. Uh, last but not least, uh, Stefan, what's your perspective? Yeah, many things there's already much said, and I would just like to add maybe two, um, two perspectives. Uh, first, um, Alex, you actually asked two questions. So first, um, about the killing order, and secondly, uh, what the death marches actually are. Um, first of all, regarding the order, um, as we know from many events, um, especially during the war, um, when it comes to systematic murder and mass murder, um, orders we're usually giving on, a, on an order way. So we don't have this like master plan, a masterpiece uh, that that's sitting in the archive, and we just pull it out, and then we have the order. But we know from many many camps like Sachsenhausen, um, not only Buchenwald but also Mauthausen, Gusen, Ravensbrück, and many others, um, where survivors as well as guards in the later trials stated that there were orders given to kill prisoners. I think that's something we have to consider um, regarding the second question. I think. When we take the term of death marches, we have, I mean, two terms. We have death and marches, um, of course, considering that many transfers were taken by train and then continued on foot. But maybe when we step back a bit and use analytical categories like time and space, that might help to actually define what stage of the system we are talking about. And going back to Daniel Blackman's study on, on death marches, um, he started his study with the liquidation of the camps Cowan, Riga, um, and, and Vajabara in, in the occupied Baltics, and then, of course, continued with a huge chapter in Auschwitz. Um, and, and I'm not quite sure if, if, of course, this goes along with, with a huge, with the unbelievable death rate, but I'm not quite sure if this is really part of the death marches, because there is still administrative order when it comes to the from to the perspective of the perpetrators, there is still still a system working, and and these transferred they have a very specific target and order. And actually, when we take Cowan and many other camps, I mean they, they were liquidated in summer 1944. So these prisoners they, they are still within the camp system for a year, and they continue their slave labor in Dachau and many many other camps. Um, but when we talk about spring 1945. That there is this public space like Martin said, where of course these um, thousands and ten thousands of prisoners were pushed in. There is no system, so maybe we just to, should talk about like the final stage of the camp system, and then death marches as part after the system, because the system is not existing anymore. Um, they're changing directions all the time. Um, there is no real place to go anymore. Um, and even for the guards, their whole training doesn't work anymore because they're out of time and space they're used to. So, so I think we're talking about a final stage of the Nazi camp system that starts in summer 44. And then we talk about the stage of death marches after the system, that that's really the final stage um, um, before the war ended. And maybe this could help to to use these categories to define the term death marches better and to understand that actually 
that we have trans mass transfers with a huge death rate on one side, and then we have really the liquidation of camps where they end up nowhere, and where, of course, Hitler, Jung, Wehrmacht, and all the others start to kill these inmates. And, and this is a different stage. I mean, it, it's hard to, uh, of course, uh, I mean, it's all, it's a huge gray zone, yeah, but um, I think we really have to be clear what stage and time and space we're actually talking about. Thank you, Stefan. Yeah, this is obviously a very fundamental question when we're discussing the death marches. What do we even mean by this term? What do we include and what do we exclude? And uh, this is, you mentioned uh, Daniel Bladman. He's written what is often regarded as the standard work on the death marches. This is one of the key questions that he, he poses repeatedly. Uh, what are the frameworks in which we can view these evacuations? Is this the final stage of the concentration camp system? Is this the final stage of the Holocaust? Is it the last genocidal activity of the Nazi regime? So this, this question of, of, um, of what we mean by it and what framework we can analyze it in is obviously a very uh, fundamental one. And we will talk a little bit more later on also about the difference between evacuations by rail and evacuations by foot. Uh, that will be uh, uh, that will come into one of my my questions later on. Um, I'd like to move on now uh, to my second question, and here I'd like to. Uh, so Stefan doesn't feel badly treated by being uh, the fourth person to answer my first question. He's going to be the first person to answer my second question. Uh, if we accept that there was an absence of a of a comprehensive order. And I absolutely agree with this, Stefan, there were individual orders given to individual uh, guard units and in individual camps. But if we accept there's an absence of a kind of nationwide comprehensive order to murder the concentration camp prisoners before their liberation, was this reflected in post-war trials of individual guards or their sentences, given that they were not always following orders? And if so, how? I mean, this was one of the key questions asked, and, and of course, even one of the key questions asked during interrogations before all these post-war trials started. Um, and I analyzed um, several trials um, regarding the British zone, the, the French zone, the US zone, and the Soviet zone, um, at least. And of course, um, very interesting, of course, is the first trial that even started um, um, before the war ended. Uh, the Lublin trial um, already started um, um, during World War II. So I think that that's, I mean, not every trial started after, after the war. Um, and what I found out after studying thousands of cases is that um, they repeatedly um, say that there was a common order to kill people that were unfit to walk and unfit to, to stay for the next day. So, so, and this is what you find pretty much on every side. So I think we have to consider if, if there wasn't at least um, one central order um, to kind of manage these uh, liquidations of camp in the final stage, talking about March, April, and May 1945. And um, interestingly is that we, of course, have to look back a bit to the, the, like, I would call them like the early death marches that start in January 45 and very interestingly in Stutthof. Um, because that's the first time when we have um, transports that end nowhere. Because they, like Auschwitz, most of the transports end in Mauthausen and Dachau and many, many other camps. The Stutthof um, liquidation starts and they stay for months um, in, in the public in, um, in Pomerania. And then in March 45, prisoners come back to the main camp because they don't have any space to go anymore. And you can see that between January and March 45, there is what, it's very cynical, but what the SS might call try and error because they don't know how to manage it. And this is a try and error stage. And after that, structures and orders were giving much more specifically, uh, especially when it comes to the evacuation of the camps in the middle of the Reich, like Sachsenhausen, Buchenwald, Ravensbrück, all these camps that were um, liquidated in April 45. And Stutthof was, was one of these try and error cases. And, and this is where they don't 
know how to behave and, and guards don't know how to behave and there are no specific orders. Should we kill, should we not kill? And this is uh, also one main question of the Hamburg trial uh, that was, um, you might have heard about the sentence in 2020 last year, I should have trial because um, because the, the accused, he kind of expressed this not existing orders in, in the early months of 1945. And then of course, continue with much more specific orders after March 45. Thank you very much, Stefan. Yes, of course, this kind of uh, feature of trial and error was very common in general in, in, in Nazi mass killing processes. This idea of uh, this is kind of our aim, but we'll leave it to you. We'll leave it to the men on the ground to work out exactly how we, we achieve that aim, how we reach that aim. Uh, Martin, what does your research uh, tell you about um, the kind of the conduct and the, the, the defense strategies of um, guards in post-war trials, particularly with regard to the question of orders? Yes. Um, first, I have to say that, again, when it comes to trials, I uh, also concentrated on civilians in trials against perpetrators of, the, of death mod crimes. But of course, uh, there are big overlaps as well, empirically as theoretically. Um, so maybe some ideas about uh, the Dachau trials, uh, which were some of the first uh, trials uh, between 1945, 1948, uh, where uh, it was about uh, also uh, about the death marches. Um, and there it is quite interesting that you had uh, the common design as a legal uh, tool, which meant that um, anyone inside of the system of concentration camp could be charged. And uh, I think uh, this would uh, very well have been possible to expand this uh, to the death marches, meaning to include also civilians who engage in action that led to the killing of prisoners. But in fact, it did uh, not happen, um, which uh, has something to do, I think, with, uh, with the lack of resource, lack of uh, money, people doing this with the problem that uh, you had. Uh, it was not easy to get uh, those death march cases together because uh, witnesses were dead. They were not easy to find. Um, German people didn't want to talk about this uh, and so on. Um, so at the end, uh, the death marches in the in the Dachau trials were were treated like uh, like an appendix to the to the camps. They were so there were uh, cases against uh, prisoners from the camps, and then and some sometimes uh, also because uh, of killing at the death marches. And regarding the question of superior orders, um, I looked uh, for this, and uh, I found that uh, Katrin Greiser, who wrote a very good uh, book about uh, evacuation or death marches from Buchenwald. And she pointed out that there were three cases where uh, the defense lawyers tried to claim this argument for their defendants. But she says that this argument never led to any mitigation in, uh, in the trials she, she looked at. Um, and then maybe we should look at the West German Nazi trials where it was really common to uh, refer to superior orders. Uh, uh, in, in other cases as well as uh, in, in the death march uh, cases, uh, because uh, this opened the possibility of being sentenced not for murder, but for having abetted uh, the killings. And uh, this focus on the chains of, chains of command had the paradox effect that um, neither the direct perpetrators nor their supposed commanders were sentenced as murderers. Um, and uh, I looked for one example for this and I found it uh, in, a, in a case from Hanover in 1963, uh, there was a trial about the evac evacuation of a Neuengamme um, subcamp where actually one SS man confessed that he himself had shot several prisoners on the march. But the court insisted that the Neuengamme commander, Max Pauli, was the main perpetrator because he was uh, the one who wanted to evacuate the camp, who, to have uh, the prisoners killed and so on. But Max Pauli was already dead because he was convicted and executed uh, by the British already in 1946. So uh, he was uh, not convicted in this case, of course, but uh, the S-man S -S who confessed, uh, he, he, he was a killer. He was also only sentenced as a helper and only got uh, three and a half years for prison. And uh, I think all in all, it very strongly depended on the composition of the court. Meaning, in other words, how strong was the Nazi past of the judges? Um, because they had a very big scope of uh, 
yeah of, of dealing with uh, with uh, this this question and uh, another uh, last uh, sentence maybe about uh, the context because this is also very interesting in these cases that um, the idea of this uh, this final phase uh, characterized by chaos by broken chains of command and doomsday mood uh, had a really paradox influence on the trials on the one hand could be seen as mitigating meaning that the whole surrounding was seen as brutalized and uh, you might have been killed if you did not kill yourself and stuff like this. But on the other hand, uh, this context could also be aggravating because uh, the scope of action was bigger and the end of Nazi rule was already foreseeable in these uh, last days. And it's quite interesting that uh, this latter in interpretation was particularly strong in East German trials in, in the GDR. There the judges uh, said, no, there was really a big scope of action and you uh, could you did not need to kill uh, in this in this specific situation. And so uh, there were really uh, higher sentences because uh, of this specific context. Thank you very much, Martin. Yes, it's, it's quite staggering some of the uh, some of the the, the, the judgments in, in West German post-war trials, this kind of differentiation on very spurious grounds between um, murder and accessory to murder, Mord and Beihilfe to Mord, uh, completely illogical from, from our point of view, but quite common during this period um, and led to, in many cases, uh, I, I, know, I know the cases of the, the Einsatzgruppen commanders, for example, quite well that, that, that some commander chiefs were sentenced to maybe 10 years in prison uh, and, and others on occasion to life imprisonment, even though they'd committed very similar crimes. But this differentiation was made between murder and accessory to murder. Uh, Chris, what do you think on the subject? This is a very interesting question. Um, and I was thinking, you know, as both Martin and Stefan was were talking that, you know, this idea of judgments, uh, judgments were made actually before the trials even started. And some of the work that I've done on my book, Force Confrontations, uh, the American soldiers who were coming upon mass atrocity sites and death march uh, mass atrocity sites were making their own judgments on who was guilty and who was responsible. And they were, of course, compelling German civilians to come to terms with what they considered to be a generic kind of, if you supported the Nazi regime, you were a member of the Nazis and therefore you needed to rebury the bodies. And then of course the military police had, uh, you know, collective guilt uh, transcripts read to the German populations in multiple towns, the ones that I studied in Bavaria. Um, but I got very interested in the guards themselves. And I did uh, have an opportunity to do work at the Buchenwald archives where there's a, a full trial transcript of one of the uh, commanders who led a death march from Buchenwald to Dachau, which is Hans Merbach. And um, in the trial testimony, I went through the trial testimony very clearly. Um, he was told that he was just given an order to move the prisoners from Buchenwald to the Weimar train station. And then from there, they're gonna make their way ultimately to Dachau in terms of just stay ahead of the Americans, just stay ahead of the American liberating forces. Um, and then there's a series of uh, witnesses and wit witness testimonies that say that Merbach clearly um, had a murderous role in, in the actual death marches and shot multiple prisoners with an automatic handgun uh, right when they left the station, uh, right when they left the camp and on the way the eight kilometers to the station. And then during this station, people would take bathroom breaks and they would get out and he would shoot them in the tunnels. So he was convicted um, and we had uh, eyewitness testimony to his murder rule. Um, he said in his defense that he was just moving prisoners uh, from camp to camp and that he was trying to stay ahead of the Americans um, and it didn't hold up in court. Um, what's really interesting in, in his defense was um, in terms of victim testimony um, and, and dead bodies, uh, he was saying that there were so many dead bodies on the road to Buchenwald because uh, I think it was Stefan who said that there was so much movement and change and trial and error. There was trains coming in, death marches moving to Buchenwald, away from Buchenwald. So Merbach had this very strange defense where he said, the bodies that you found on the road to the Weimar train station, they're not from me. They're from an earlier death march. So I'm being overcharged. Um, with these killings. And you can't link any of these bodies specifically to my death march, only to other death marches. So therefore I'm being framed. 
um, in this trial. Um, it doesn't work, obviously, because they have the eyewitness testimony of the people who survived the death march and pointed the finger directly at Merbach. But it's very interesting that his defense is, I was just moving prisoners ahead of it, but don't blame me for everything. I may have done something because prisoners were escaping, but I'm not responsible for hundreds of murders. He said, I'm only responsible for three. Um, and ultimately 2000 people died under his command. So um, I thought that was a very interesting kind of spotlight on one person's defense at the Dachau trials in 1946. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, and that relates back to what Margaret was saying earlier about the self-interest and motivations of individual mm -hmm. guards. And obviously this is something we see quite often that the, the guards are saying, well, I've been, given, I've been given one order effectively and that's to stay ahead of the advancing allies and I'm going to do anything that I have to do in order to achieve that aim, in order to stay ahead. And that means anybody who fall, falls behind, I kill them. Mm -hmm. uh, Margaret, would you like to add to what's already been said? Uh, just to follow up on Chris's point about witnesses, uh, I think that's very interesting that uh, there were enough witnesses that the court decided to convict on this, because in other cases, there were very few witnesses either remaining or findable. Uh, but also we find that oftentimes, particularly in case of survivors as witnesses, that their testimony was often discounted as uh, emotional, as self-interested, uh, and therefore not particularly credible. Also, given the chaotic situation and the frequent changing of guards in the whole death march process, oftentimes survivors did not know how to identify a particular guard. They might not have known his name, for example. Um, so that's really all that I can add from my perspective. Thank you. Yes, it's, uh, this certainly added to the and was part of this chaotic situation. And from early 1945, you also have an increased breakdown in the transportation network and an, in an increased kind of shift from uh, rail evacuations or evacuation by, by truck and that kind of thing to, to these forced marches that we see that have become so emblematic of, of these evacuations. Maybe I could start with you, uh, Margaret, uh, with my next question. Um, and that would be, and it's something we've, we've, we've touched on already, Although much of the journey to the camps further inside the Reich was, was often covered by rail, particularly um, during the early evacuations of summer and autumn 1944, um, how can we explain that popular memory of these evacuations is dominated by so-called death marches you know, by foot? I think there's there are two ways of answering this. One has to do with more sort of the international community and the way in which I, I believe many of us here uh, in this Zoom space uh, first encounter death marches. And that would be through Elie Wiesel's book, Night, where he's evacuated from Auschwitz. And I think, and even though part of that evacuation does take place by rail, I think some of the more memorable and horrifying elements of it uh, actually took place on foot. You know, certainly when he talks about the uh, rabbi's son who is running in order to distance himself uh, from uh, his father, or um, when they stop for the night and this one boy plays his violin and then is dead in the morning. Um, but, uh, that I think makes a big impression on readers. Um, but in terms of, uh, for German popular memory, um, it has to do with this idea that, that railway cars going through a train station or passing by um, on the tracks don't necessarily make the same kind of impression as columns of prisoners walking through the town, uh, walking through the fields and bodies being uh, left or murdered at familiar locations. And so that familiar locations become uh, part of uh, these horror sites. And, and that also makes, I think, a really deep impression uh, on people. Um, and sort of to go to uh, what Martin has talked about um, and uh, the fear of these prisoners, the, and, and which really explains why oftentimes escaped prisoners were denounced or murdered by locals, um, had to do with their belief that these people were dangerous. Um, and 
just to give a different perspective on this, um, Israel Charney, who's a genocide scholar and psychologist, has talked about the way in which um, our sort of common psychological need to believe in a just world, that we have to believe that you know, there are reasonable explanations for things, natural consequences um, can uh, lead one to not sympathize with a prisoner. And so we do have, uh, Oh, you've frozen, Margaret. Maybe until we hopefully get Margaret back, we can... Uh, and to, to they must ah, have done Margaret's something back. horrible in order to merit this type of treatment. And that means we need to protect ourselves. I'm sorry, did I freeze? You did, unfortunately, but we're glad to have you back, Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's a really important point that you made, this proximity, this... Um, this kind of this nearness of of the 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 prisoners marching through individual towns and villages and the dead bodies on the road this this is obviously inevitably going to to kind of move somebody in whatever way uh, more so than i think a train passing through um so i think that is definitely a, a crucial point stefan would you like to add anything to that because I, I know you you raised it earlier this this idea of what do we even mean by death marches what's what what are we talking about with this concept yeah and and maybe we should go back to the case margaret just mentioned to to the um evacuation of, of auschwitz because um what we see is that of course we have um mass deportations and transports that start in auschwitz and end up in many other camps within the reich and at the same time we have also mass deportations from other camps um, like Stutthof that were pretty much um, in planning of to be liquidated as well. Um, and um, going back to Daniel Blotman, he kind of includes um, the, the liquidation of the Auschwitz camp into the death marches, but other mass deportations not. And we have many mass, I mean, this is winter, winter 44, 45. So, so there are many, many transfers uh, that really cross the whole Reich, transfers of several thousand prisoners where we have on every transfer a, a high death rate. And, and some of them are counted into death marches and some are not. And I think this is like the stage we have to kind of distinguish and see what are mass deportations that still have a place to go. So kind of um, they're aimed and, and, and the final stage, they're aimless. So and regarding the guards, and this is a question you asked earlier, um, within the camp, there is a space of power. So they know what to do. They are trained to stay on the watchtower um, at the fence, um, to, to have uh, their line uh, and so on and so forth. And when they are especially in March, April, May 45, when they go into that open space, they don't have that control anymore. And this is very often when we see at the interrogations of guards, a reason to kill a prisoner because losing control, this is something the SS feared always. And when we go back to the mass killings that started in 1944, um, in Stutthof with the gas chamber, uh, Ravensbrück gas chamber as well. So we have many mass killings, especially of, of sick and unfit inmates starting in summer 44. This is, you can already see that the SS is killing prisoners because they fear to lose control of that camp. So what they do is, what they always have done best, they kill because that, that's from their perspective, the only solution to get control back. And you can see this kind of behavior uh, when it comes to March, April, May 45, because that's, that's what they were trained to do. When they lose control, they kill. And um, Chris mentioned Meerbach. Meerbach, I mean, he was the chief of, of a guard union in Auschwitz-Birkenau so, so for, for years. So this man, know, I mean, he knew how to kill. Um, and they're very interesting interrogations that are in the National Archives in the S of Merbach, where he actually stated the, the, the killings of, of the European Jews in Auschwitz. So, so this is, um, so this is his, his background. And this behavior comes back. Um, and the last sentence, 
I think this is always has well, this has been always a confusion when we come to transfers that were train and unfit, and some are counted as death marches and some are not. And I think this is actually maybe not the key question to ask. Maybe we should really see on the interdependencies, on the structures, on is there still a system in effect? Do, where do these transports end? Is it a mass deportation or mass transport we are talking about? Or is it actually um, these liquidation transfers that end up in nowhere? Um, like Gardelin, yeah, where we have the, the huge killing um, of more than 1,000 inmates um, in the middle of Germany um, because they don't have any place to go anymore. And what they do at the end, they kill everybody. Yeah, thank you, Stefan. Uh, I'm not always a big fan of um, the concept of space as an explanatory model. I think it's often misused, misapplied, but I, I think you might have hit on something there. I think it could be quite fruitful in this context, this idea of guards suddenly finding themselves outside of their comfort zone, no longer in this environment of the camp that they know so well and they know exactly how to behave. And they're suddenly outside of the camp and then they're, they're fearful of losing control. Um, you wanted to add something? Uh, yeah, just very short. It's not only the geographical space. I'm, I'm talking about the space of behavior and of the course. space of thinking yeah, and the space of power. So, so there are different kinds of spaces I think we have to consider. Absolutely. Martin, what do you think? Well, I, I don't have so much to add because I'm I'm absolutely with uh, what what Margaret said uh, about uh, about the visibility of, of those uh, those marches in the villages. Um, but I was thinking more maybe about a linguistic point that that might be reconsidered here because I think the term death march it is such a strong and impressive word that that. Yeah, that that you, you keep in mind when when you hear it for the first time, and it's uh, it's much more remarkable than transport by train evacuation, which could mean anything else. But I think the word death march is just yeah so strong. And um, thinking about this, um, I'm as far as I know, there uh, yet we do not have a really, or I did not find it, and some kind of etymology for this word um, so as far as I know prisoners use the term themselves um, but I could not trace the first source for for this I could not trace this uh, really back so I think there's uh, some work to do and uh, I would be really happy to hear from maybe from the other panelists or someone else uh, to to trace back uh, this this ter term term uh, even more thank you Martin um, yes I, that's also, as far as I know, it, it, it comes from the prisoners themselves. Uh, maybe, maybe one of you does have more details on that particular question, where this term actually comes from. I find it's interesting that uh, in recent literature, um, the term death marches has also been applied to the forced evacuate or forced marches of um, Soviet prisoners of war in the winter of 1941-42, because huge numbers of of, of Soviet prisoners die during these evacuations during the extremely cold months of the winter of 41 42 so that's interesting in itself that this this term which is is, is uh, so associated with the evacuations of late 44 and particularly early 45 is now also being applied to other um, phases of, uh, of, of of Nazi German violence during the second world war um, Chris, you have the, the final word on, on this question. Yeah, um, of course, the, the question is about uh, kind of the popular memory and the popular history around the Holocaust. And, and I find, at least in the States here, that there's um, an effort to kind of simplify the narrative. And therefore, the death march fits nicely into a, a kind of chronological narrative. Um, and of course, as we've seen in this panel is doing quite well is 
um, historians tend to complicate those simple narratives of, of time and and causality. So I think that you know I think it's it's a it's a, a, a bit of a simplistic causal. Uh, you know the uh, the de the death camp system is over, and now we have this final phase of the Holocaust, or is which is uh, the death marches. Uh, but in reality, as as everyone has said, uh, these death marches had been occurring for longer than most people imagine, in terms of time time and also in terms of the actual movement of people uh, by train and people have forgot there are also trucks involved. Uh, then the Americans and the allies were bombing all of anything that moved on the railway lines was bombed and many uh, of these trains were bombed by uh, US uh, forces as well and Canadian forces um, and where I studied. So there is a there's a good deal of chaos and there's a good deal of different uh, aspects of the death march. Uh, but I think because of the need to kind of put it in a simple chronological causal order, uh, the death marches fit quite well. And, and I think it's an apt term uh, for the reasons that people gave, but I think it's something that uh, we as historians have, have finally looked at and begun to really unpack and try to understand the complexities, both on a kind of a micro level and a macro level about what these death marches were, particularly uh, through the spring of 1945. Absolutely, and that's what we're, we're here to discuss. Thank you, Chris. Um, not doing too badly for time, seven minutes to wait. Uh, I'd like to now move on to my final question, and I'd like to start with you, uh, Chris. Although the camp prisoners during these months were a uh, um, highly heterogeneous group with Jews comprising only one, albeit large component part, making up uh, somewhere between a third and a half of the evacuated prisoners. And also it's not entirely clear that Jews were always treated fundamentally worse than other prisoners. So keeping these two things in mind, how can we explain that the, the death marches are associated in popular memory first and foremost, and I think this is the case, with the Holocaust, i.e. the genocide of European Jewry. Yeah, and I think I can refer back to my earlier answer about the narrative of the Holocaust um, and the death marches as part of that narrative. The, um, in my own research, I was actually surprised by how heterogeneous the victim group was for the death marches that I looked at. And they were particularly death marches from Flossenburg concentration camp. Um, and that uh, the identification of the bodies by allied forces and uh, military police after, after the event was really a, a group that included you know, um, obviously Jews, but Polish forced laborers, Yugoslavian, Hungarian, Czechoslovakian. There was a vast uh, number of uh, uh, Soviet POWs that were part of the, uh, the death marches that were killed. Um, and in some cases, the majority of those who they found in the mass graves um, were non-Jewish. I do know that there, in certain cases, uh, that there was um, a, a majority of Jews. And it's interesting the way I found that out was when the uh, allied forces uh, and townspeople came to move the bodies from the primary grave to the secondary grave. Um, Jewish uh, survivors of the death march from their surrounding towns insisted that only they handled the bodies, that these could not be handled by anyone but Jews. So the Kaddish was said at the graveside. And then many of these uh, burials in town cemeteries um, happened um, to, they, re, they, they reinterred the bodies later in Jewish cemeteries, interestingly on the outskirts of town, not to be mixed with the town uh, dead, and also in memorial cemeteries back in the concentration camps. So um, it actually was very difficult, I think, in some cases to identify who the Jewish, Jewish victims were from the non-Jewish victims. But I think in the popular imagination, I think for the same reason of uh, the, the narrative that uh, that is associated almost exclusively um, with Jewish victims. But in, in reality, uh, I, I was finding uh, whole mass graves that were nothing but Russian POWs who had worked in a town fixing bridges, fixing roads, and were killed uh, instead of even death marching. They just were killed right where they were forced laborers. So, But I'll leave it to the rest of the panel to, to open that up a bit. Thank you, Chris. Yes, I think uh, probably taken together, forced laborers of, of one nationality or another perhaps even made up the majority of um, the death marches victims. Margaret, would you like to add something on this question? Yes. Um, so again, I think 
uh, Elie Wiesel's book, Night, gets some credit for this because Auschwitz becomes so iconic and represents the Holocaust uh, so much in popular memory. And so it, the death march from there is associated then with uh, the Holocaust. Um, but also uh, to build on what Chris was talking about in terms of burials and reburials, um, the Jewish uh, survivors uh, upon liberation, the first organizations they created were burial societies. It's very traditional uh, in the Jewish community that that is the most essential group institution in the community. So that's founded first before anything else. And so these survivors demanded of the allied uh, soldiers that there be proper burials for Jewish dead. And, and uh, Germans were oftentimes pressed into uh, carrying the bodies. I mean, in the exhibition, there's a photograph from Neuenburg von Wald, uh, with, which shows primarily women carrying uh, coffins uh, to bury uh, these death march victims. And we have to remember in the closing days of the war, um, teenage boys, elderly men were all called up to service. And so it was primarily women who were then doing uh, this dirty work uh, of burying. And um, I anyway, mean, so I just wanted to bring up that image. But then later on uh, in 1946, you then had Jewish survivors reenacting uh, through marches and processions uh, following the death march routes. Uh, in order to commemorate what had happened there and really make it very much a Jewish event, um, carrying banners demanding that Jews be allowed to immigrate to Palestine. Um, and so, and with, with Jewish uh, DP police, DP for displaced persons, police patrolling the, the procession route uh, in order to maintain order. And we're being very proud of having conducted that role. So that again, sort of connects the death march, even though there were other victims of those death marches, I think the memorialization and commemoration by uh, these survivors helps to uh, imprint the Holocaust onto this. Um, and there was also in Neuenburg von Wald in uh, 1946, there was another mass grave discovered and exhumed uh, with uh, the bodies and reburied. It became a, a scandal because uh, some of the Jewish survivors beat the Germans who were exhuming the bodies. Um, and it actually ended up uh, leading uh, to the United States deciding to abandon that policy as being counterproductive. It was no longer educating Germans. In fact, it was turning Germans against US policy. So, but anyway, but again, associate it with Jews, even though there would be others uh, in the graves. Thank you very much, Margaret. Yeah, that's a, a very crucial factor here, this idea of uh, visibility and, and representation and commemoration. Uh, Stefan, would you like to add something to what's already been said? Yeah, I, I think at this point, we also have to go back to the study of um, Daniel Gold. Um, and um, Daniel Blattmann, of course, uh, Goldhung stated that this is the final stage of the Holocaust. And um, I think he really shaped the, the public discourse about it um, highly. Um, and Daniel Blattmann, on, on the other side, um, stated that it is not the final stage, although at the end of his book, he's kind of saying, well, it is still kind of the, of the final stage of the Holocaust. So he's very unclear. Um, of course, he's um, talking about the differences of his study and, and Daniel Goldhang's study on one side and on the other side, he's actually kind of moving at the end of his book towards Goldhang's thesis. Um, I think interestingly, we also have to step back maybe a few weeks before all these um, transports and, and marches started um, because we already have mass murder and systematic mass murder going on in these camps. Um, and if you analyze the, the numbers of deaths at this time, and I think, I mean, it's not clear how many people died in, within the whole, like, let's say, three to, to five final months um, of the system, but approximately 250,000 out of 700,000 died um, after um, between January 45 and May 45. But, um, when you look at these killings, especially, let's say, Robin Sprick, um, you have the, the gas chamber that um, 
was um, established in, in early 1945. And you have about two thirds of the deaths are non-Jewish and one third are Jewish. So, so they have this, what Chris talked about, because the, the terms of selection and the criteria of selection were mostly unfit for forced labor, slave labor, um, and sick. When it comes to the liquidation of the Liberosa camp, a subcamp of Sachsenhausen, um, more than 1,300 prisoners were killed with the liquidation of that camp, and most of them were Jews. So you have both at the same time, and you have on, on one side still what I would call like utilitaristic select, selection criteria, where they kind of have this illusion that the that there might be a system that might continue even in the north or in the south, and that of course, if they kill people, they only kill sick and unfit people, and then you have other camps where there is of course, it is racism that is driving the guards, and 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 um, of course, this is part of the Holocaust. You, so it's happening at the same time, and you cannot really distinguish both of them. So it is it is as complex. And it is so so you have both you have the final stage of the holocaust on one side and you still have these like utilitaristic drive that himmler started um in in 1944 when he in june or may of 44 decided that of course this the reich was judenfrei he called and of course then he kind of deported hundreds of thousands of Jewish people back to the Reich to, to use them as slave laborers. So you have both at the same time. And at the end, I think this is what Himmler made always very clear. We have to use them for the armament industries or whatsoever. But at the end, I mean, the sentence, the death sentence was very clear. Um, they have to die. So it is always the final stage of the Holocaust. Thank you, Stefan. Yeah, I think we're probably making a mistake in trying to force these events into one framework, one analytical framework or another analytical framework or one uh, process, one medrus process or another medrus process. And I would agree, Stefan, that we can actually say it was part of both. It wasn't just limited. It wasn't just either parts of the Holocaust or not. We can actually uh, incorporate it into different processes that were taking part at the same time, the collapse of the concentration camp system, the uh, the Reich effectively devouring itself and also the final stages of the Holocaust and say, yes, it was part of all three of these. Um, Martin, maybe a final word from you before we uh, allow questions from the audience. Um, yes, maybe just uh, some uh, remarks to, in some kind of way, maybe bring in another perspective uh, when we think about this, um, this dominant um, association of, of, of Jewish uh, death march victims, because I'm not sure if this is true uh, for all segments or, or all phases of, of, of perception or memory culture, because when you think about um, East Germany and the, the GDR, I think you have a completely different um, image of, of death march victims, because as you know, uh, in the GDR, the prototype concentration camp prisoner, he might have been Jewish some way, but first of all, he was he was a political prisoner, uh, especially communist, and uh, this is also what the what uh, then in, in in ideology and propaganda in the GDR. Uh, this is what uh, the prototype death march prison, prisoner also uh, looks like, um, and there is even a phase in the in the late nineteen. Uh, 50s, early 60s, when um, there were some kind of attempts to 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 apply the idea of of the self liberation of Buchenwald, which was a very very important uh, part of of, of uh, state ideology. Uh, when they tried to apply this onto the death marches, but not for Buchenwald, but uh, for Sachsenhausen, because Sachsenhausen was liberated by the Red Army, so there was not so much need uh, to uh, to to create another story, but um, yeah, so there was there were some narratives that uh, th that uh, said that uh, the prisoners on this march from Sachsenhausen they were organized in some party structures and then they made contact to the Red Army. They armed themselves and then 
they liberated themselves just on the eve of uh, 1st of May, which is also uh, the uh, labor day. So uh, it was not really uh, accidentally. Uh, and I, I think this, in the end, this became not an, a dominant narrative, but, but I found it remarkable to see uh, how, how uh, this ideologic uh, concept was transferred even onto the death marches. Thank you, Martin. Yeah, that's something that we haven't really talked about today, this kind of difference in the perspective between West Germany and East Germany. And this is, of course, uh, a very important thing to keep in mind. Uh, we're going to uh, open the floor to the audience and allow questions. We don't have any questions yet, so I'd like to give the audience um, another couple of minutes. Okay, we have our first question. Just before we move on to that, I just want to say a big thank you, a big interim thank you to the four panellists for these fantastic answers to my questions. We kind of rushed through them, but you all succeeded every single time in giving amazing answers and not repeating each other once. So I'm highly impressed. Okay. Um, so thank you for this illuminating discussion, says Lynn Wolf or Wolf. Uh, I would be interested in hearing more about civilian reactions to the forced confrontation with the death marches. And that is, of course, part of our panel title, Forced Confrontations. Are there oral histories or documentations that any of the panelists would recommend? So I would just say whoever wants to answer this question can do rather than me picking someone. You can all see the chat, right? The four of you. So I'm, excuse me, um, I'm not aware of uh, oral histories um, just off the top of my head, um, but I did find uh, in my research, particularly about the exhumations and reburials, um, an interesting type of forgetting uh, that occurred in uh, at least some German communities. So for example, um, in the, exhumation reburial in Neuenburg vom Wald, uh, German survivors, this is in 1946, uh, were adamant in the historical record and documentation that there were, or these were Jewish victims or at least predominantly Jewish victims. And they said, they knew that because of scraps of prayers that were found, phylacteries, tefillin that were found. And so, uh, they made that argument, whereas Germans who were involved in the exhumation claimed that, no, these people were wearing partial military uniforms. These were actually combatants. And so they were casualties of war, not casualties of a death march. Um, there was a rather remarkable uh, exhumation reburial that took place uh, in August of 1946, where the Jewish committee in Tirschenreuth was able to convince the local uh, American military uh, uh, government official to uh, exhume 30, well, their numbers are anyway, somewhere in the 30s, uh, prisoners, uh, death march victims, and to transfer them uh, miles away to uh, a Jewish cemetery in Floss. And the American commander had uh, ordered the Germans along all the villages along the route to come out in their Sunday best and to bear their heads out of respect. And so there's this big procession. Uh, they arrive, they bury the bodies in this mass grave in the Jewish cemetery in Floss. Well, sometime later, uh, the people in Floss remembered that the people in that grave uh, were ones who'd been bombed by the allies. Uh, there had been an event in April of 1945 where a train carrying concentration camp inmates from Flossenburg uh, had been bombed and there were some victims there. And so they rewrote it, that history, so that the victims in the grave were not victims of a death march, but in fact were victims of an allied bombing raid. So it's just interesting to see the way in which um, some communities try to rewrite the history um, and omit German responsibility for the dead. And I, <clears throat> I wanna to add to this as well. And since a lot of my work was actually looking at um, the US military's forced confrontation um, of German civilians that I, I had the opportunity to comb through the documentary evidence. And what, the most useful 
documents uh, because the military record from the US military record, since it was such a kind of on the move uh, uh, period of the war is after action reports where they talk about, there was just, we, we left behind a unit that forced German civilians to rebury the bodies. And that's all it said, unfortunately, in the archives. And then other times there was the Signal Corps photographs, which are great documentary evidence of these forced confrontations of German civilians. But also people forget that there was war correspondence embedded, that's a modern term, embedded into the US military, the Third Army in particular. And they wrote stories in the Indianapolis Star and Stars and Stripes magazine and a lot of the military and also the, the, the larger newspapers like the New York Tribune about these forced confrontation of German civilians. And you can read that and you can see quotes from the townspeople. And they're not very illuminating because here's this trauma of defeat and war. And then you have an American reporter asking a German civilian in English, you were probably, uh, you know, what did you feel? Uh, what did you think about this? And uh, the, the common response was everyone deserves a decent burial, which is a, a safe answer to a difficult question during a traumatic time is the way I think I put it. So, um, and I also did oral testimonies with uh, people, but they were five years old, six years old in 1945. Um, and they said, well, it was just fascinating to see my town. Um, the first time I saw the army was in the war was during this forced confrontation um, in April and May 1945. So there aren't any great oral testimonies out there. There are film clips. There are Signal Corps photographs that are available on the US Holocaust Memorial Museum uh, website that give you um, almost a, a, a very powerful image of what it was like and what German civilians saw, what they were forced to see, and as Mar Margaret uh, points out quite well, what, what they want to remember about those, those days. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Chris, for those insights. Uh, I hope that answered your question, Lynn. Uh, I'm going to take one more question because uh, we're approaching quarter past eight. Uh, so this would be the final question. Um, by trying to ascertain how many Jews or not made up the death marches, are we not at risk of forgetting that Jews were in the Holocaust from the beginning because of their Jewishness and not because of their ability to work or not? Do any of you have thoughts on that question? If I understand this question correctly, it's the idea that Jews were persecuted because of their supposed race rather than for any other more practical reasons. Stefan? Yeah, this is what I pointed out earlier, that of course the death marches are always um, a part of the final stage of the Holocaust because um, the persecution of Jews was set from the very beginning. And of course, um, I mean, especially since the 1940s, it was very clear that um, that they should be killed. And we, I mean, we look at the um, Auschwitz mass murder of Jews from Hungary, especially between May and July 1944, and we see that they kill more than 325,000 within six weeks. And on the other side, you have this increasement of, of, of forced enslaved labor. Um, so this is, this is not because um, perpetrators um, become human, I mean, kind of sensitive now and, and, and decide, of course, that Jews should stay alive. This is a very pragmatic reason behind just to use them for a certain time, but it never changed, it never changed the decision that, of course, at the end, all these people have to die. So that's why the Holocaust never stopped. But the, the, the causes of World War II, and especially the change in, I mean, you, you can see the Red Army um, moving towards the right. You have the front in, in Italy and in the West. And of course, at that point, Hitler decides that he will deport hundreds of thousands of Jewish inmates into the right to use them as forced laborers but not to keep them alive, but just to use them and kill them later. So the decision never changed. And I think that's why um, when it comes to, to perpetrator behavior, to their ideology and, and to the discussion of were they opportunists or true believers or whatsoever, but at the end, at the end, this racist belief that of course Jews should not be part of the German society, always state. And the decision within the camp system to kill these people was set. 
So that's why at the end, it is always, always part of the Holocaust. Thank you very much, Stefan. I think we can all agree with that. And I think it's a, a fitting note on which to bring this panel to a close. It's been my pleasure to, uh, to chair it. And thank you so much to my four co-panelists, Margaret Feinstein, Stefan Hördler, Chris Moriello, and Martin Winter. I'd like to hand back to Christine Schmidt now. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm Christine Schmidt. I'm from the Wiener Holocaust Library and one of the co-curators of the exhibition. And on behalf of our partners in the Holocaust and Genocide Research Partnership, I want to thank each of the panelists for such a rich and detailed discussion of some of the key questions that we tried to explore in the exhibition. And of course, with special thanks to Alex for leading the discussion. I completely agree with your review of the discussion. Uh, fantastic. Um, and what's terrific about this format is it allows us to delve more deeply into com the complexity of issues that we could only sort of touch on in the exhibition. So um, such as these different interpretations of the definition of the term and framing the marches temporally, geographically and spatially, um, as well as post-war justice and memory. So on that note, I would also like to mention that we have a few more events coming up in this series. Another panel discussion focused on commemorations, which, was, which we also touched on a bit uh, tonight, um, as well as a talk by Manfred Goldberg, who will speak about his experiences of surviving Stutthof, which of course uh, Stefan also mentioned earlier. Um, we'll also uh, likely have an opportunity for Q&A with Dan and myself on um, the HDRP Twitter feed sometime early in August. So um, have a look out for that. We'll try not to um, be too, uh, too much of a Twitter noobs to, to make that happen. And hopefully that will work out well. Um, neither of us are, are great at Twitter, but we'll, we'll do our best. Um, and Imogen will post links to the events that are already open for registration. And finally, just want to thank all of you in the audience who've stuck it out with us. Um, and thank you for your questions and your participation. And we hope to see you online again soon at one of our events or at one of the exhibitions in London or in Huddersfield. So thank you all. And I hope you have a good evening. Thanks again. Thank you.